Hi, good evening. I'm Carol Kowalski. I'm the Assistant Town Manager for Development. Thank you to coming tonight to Housing Lexington. This is for Lexington Next, Lexington's comprehensive plan update. I want to thank the Planning Board members Richard Canale and Bob Creech and Bob Peters who are here tonight, and Selectman Joe Pato, who is the Board of Selectmen's Liaison to the Comprehensive Plan Advisory Committee. Uh, and I'd like if, if um, when I call your name, the members of the Comprehensive Plan Advisory Committee, if you could just raise your hand in case folks want to talk with you afterwards. Uh, um, Co-Chair Sarah Felton is here. Thank you. And Stacy Butel is here in the back. Hema Bott is in the back. Thank you. And Matt Daggett is here. He's one of our speakers tonight. And Len Morsporte is in the front. And Marilyn Fenelosa is right here. I feel terrible if I've overlooked anyone. I don't think I have. Okay. And uh, I want to thank all of you for coming tonight. I also, um, these are just quick introductions because I'm going to turn it over to the important introduction of our brand new planning director. Uh, Julie Mercier comes to us from the town of Reading. We are thrilled to have Thank you all for attending tonight. Um, tonight's discussion is going to be regarding um, trends in Lexington's home prices, housing stock, and affordability. For Lexington Next, the comprehensive plan update that the town is currently in the process of. Tonight we'll have presentations by Liz Rust, the Director of the Regional Housing Services Office that includes eight towns, Acton, Bedford, Burlington, Concord, Lexington, Sudbury, Wayland, and Weston. Um, and then Chris Kletchman, the fellow, a fellow of the American Institute of Certified Planners, Program Director for Governor Baker's Housing Choice Initiative. And Matt Daggett, uh, he's a town meeting member and a member of the Comprehensive Plan Advisory Committee. So first I'm just going to put this housing discussion in a little bit of context. We have a couple of initiatives underway in the planning office in town, um, and also townwide. Sorry. The reason we're all here tonight, the comprehensive plan update. Housing is an integral component of this. Um, tonight's discussion is a follow-up to two discussions that happened last spring regarding re regional housing issues and trends. Um, the links to the, those events are on the um, comprehensive plan page, which is accessed through the planning office page on the town website. I encourage anyone who wasn't able to attend to look at those videos. They're very interesting. Um, and then we also have the housing production plan, which was um, drafted in March of 2014 and is due for an update. And I believe the update will be happening in-house. So before we get to the expert presenters, I'm going to go into the basics, Lexington housing, Lexington housing basics. Um, I'm assuming that most of you will be pretty familiar with the things I'm going to discuss. Um, I'm going to try to speak to the information that's on the slides, so you can either listen to me or read the slides. You don't won't have to do both at the same time. Um, and also, I'd like you to please note that the data that we're using is from the American Community Survey, which is for the five-year period from 2013 to 2017, so it has some limitations. So, um, Housing units and occupancy. The total housing units in town is 12,230. Um, of those units, 11,735 are occupied, which is an occupancy rate of 96%, which is above the state occupancy rate of about 90%. The average household size um, for owner-occupied units in town is 2.97 people. Um, for the state, it's 2.69, so that's you know 0.3 of a percentage point greater than the state. And then the average household size for renter-occupied households is 2.07, which is about 2.2% of a percentage point below the state. 
Whether these deviations are statistically significant is something that the town might want to unpack during the comprehensive plan process. Regarding housing tenure, um, the town is largely owner occupied, 81%, um, with the remaining 19% renter occupied. The vast majority of the owner occupied housing is single family. Um, I think about 75% of the housing stock in town is single family. Demand for rental units, um, both by current residents of Lexington and outsiders or former residents of Lexington, is something that might be an interesting um, metric to quantify. So the length of time of the of Lexington residents um, in their current unit, you'll see on the top bar less than 15% of um, householders have lived in their unit for more than 40 years. Um, and then if you add the bottom three bars together, I think it's about 62% have lived, have moved into their units since the year 2000. So net new units in town, I think we have 108 new units from when this data was collected starting in 2011. Um, this is the building permit data from the town of Lexington. So you can see the peak years were 2011 and 2015, where there were 32 net new units. So this um, would take teardowns into account. And it's important to note that regarding net new units, in 2018 we actually had a net loss of two units in town. Um, so more units were torn down last year than were constructed. And so speaking of teardowns, um, I have a slide here that compares new single family homes versus teardowns. The blue line is um, new single family homes that were built without needing to tear down an existing home. The orange line is um, new homes that were built um, after an existing home was torn down. They intersect in 1997 and that's when teardowns in town became the predominant form of housing development. Here's a bit of data regarding median list price versus sale price. The median list price in Lexington um, has been higher than the median sale price in uh, this is recent data from Zillow through February of 2019. Um, it's that way for some other towns in the area, as you can see on this slide. And uh, median gross rent in Lexington. Um, this slide is similar to the last slide, but it also goes into the difference between 10, 2010 and 2017 and the percent change. So while we have a lower percent change than other towns in this area, it is important to note that our rents started fairly high um, based on the data on this slide. And in summary, the data that I just showed you, so the town is predominantly owner occupied and single family. Over 60% of residents moved into the unit since 2000. Uh, net new units have been low in recent years, less than zero last year. Teardowns are the primary form of housing development. Um, median list price has exceeded median sale price in recent years, or recent, sorry, recent data. Um, and median gross rent is high, but comparable to other towns. So that concludes my presentation and um, we have some upcoming presentations for the comprehensive plan. These are all posted on the website, um, as I mentioned earlier, which is listed on the bottom of the screen. And I'll turn my presentation over now to Liz Russ, who will talk about housing affordability. Thank you.
Thank you, Julie, um, and welcome to Lexington, I can say that, <laughs> as a non-Lexington resident. Uh, anyway, so hi, I'm Liz Rust. I direct the Regional Housing Services Office, and um, there's an introduction to the service model for the Regional Housing Services Office. As Julie mentioned, it's a, a collaboration of eight towns, and it started in 2011, and Lexington was not only a founding member, but one of the... Uh, the brains behind the collaboration. Carl Valente was a was a strong believer in trying to put together a municipal approach to assisting town staff with their affordable housing administration. And that's what we do. We really uh, support the planning department and the town in all matters of affordable housing. So some of those are, you can see the um, what the member town services are on the left and uh, the towns on the right and some statistics there. It's a little blurry. Can you see that over there? I don't really know how to do that. Um, but, uh, and so I'm here to talk about really the affordable housing component. I put together a glossary that's on your chair. So that has a lot of the, there's always an educational component with affordable housing and there are always a lot of terms and it's a very complicated field, which is why you have to hire us to help. <laughs> uh, so we'll talk a little about definitions, inventory, agencies, and really the Lexington perspective. I think through the presentations today, you're going to get a lot of a lot of data and a lot of information. So it's going to take some time probably to absorb and all that. And we'll take questions at the end, I think, when all the information is together. So as I mentioned, right, lots of terms with affordable housing, but I'd like to start with, uh, you know, what is affordable housing? People always wonder because there's so many different income levels and terms and all that. I think of affordable housing with a capital A as housing that has a housing restriction placed on the property. So it's restricted in some basis. Those restrictions can vary in all different ways. They can vary by 10 years in perpetuity, low income, moderate income, they could have resale price limitations or not, and different programs have different requirements, but what makes it capital A is that it has a restriction, a formal restriction, which is recorded at the registry. And small a is that it's affordable to you as a, as a resident when you are making, when you're paying towards housing less than 30% of your income. Just like a bank would do. When you go to buy a house and get a mortgage, they're only going to lend you, they take your income, they do 30%, maybe they'll go up to 38%, but they use the term cost burden over 30%, and anything under, if you're paying under 30% for housing, then it's considered small affordable, small a affordable. So I use those two basic terms to kind of split, like when we talk about affordable housing, that's what we're talking about. Now all of this, is, this is very high level because you say what counts as paying towards housing and if it's rental and the utilities and the taxes and the condo fees and all that, but at the highest level, those are the definitions. The other big term that people use and throw around a lot is the AMI, the Area Median Income, as a, as, a, as a method of eligibility for housing. So this is, just as it says, the Area Median Income. Sounds very easy. Um, we, here in Lexington, are part of the Boston area. And it's really the Boston that goes as far south as Duxbury, maybe even I don't even know. And it goes. That's, there's like it's a big arc, and it's way more than Lexington. Um, but it's the Boston, Cambridge, Quincy metropolitan statistical area, as published by HUD, Housing and Urban Development, once a year, on whatever schedule they feel it works for them. <laughs> so any day now, the new income limits will come out for 2019. Um, so I was, I was crazy because the whole country depends on these income limits and everyone's kind of waiting, you know, because when they come out, like lots of things happen. Um, but they publish these income limits for the whole country. And those are the ones that are used. And they publish 
30%, 50%, extremely low income, very low income, low income, 100% or the regular AMI or the area median income, which you can call it regular, the area median income, and then lots of things are derived from those numbers. Um, and for most programs, they will provide a maximum gross income level for eligibility. Like you can only make this much money by how many people in your household. So if you're a household of four, I think in the handout, the, the glossary it actually has the income limits there. You know, if you're a household of four and you're looking for this sort of standard SHI 80% AMI housing, um, you know, it would be 81,100. And again, this is, these are gross income. So sometimes they feel a little high, but you know, gross income always feels higher than what you actually are bringing home in your paycheck, you know. Um, the next big term is the SHI or subsidized housing inventory. Um, and that is the counting of a community's affordable housing and counting in the special DHCD way of counting um, towards a 10% mandate of affordable housing. And that mandate uh, allows you to um, um, so 40B is a, is, a, is, a, is a zoning mechanism where if you're under that 10%, developers can come and bypass your local zoning for, um, to develop their project. So when you're over above the 10%, you are not required to approve those developments. So Lexington's been above 10% for many years and will continue to be so. Uh, it is a municipal asset, I, can, I think. Um, I work with many communities, and communities spend a, you know, a long time in strategies to get to 10%. And once communities are at 10%, they like to stay at 10%. Now, it's at percent, so they, you have a numerator and a denominator. The numerator are the, the units of affordable housing that you count, and the denominator is the census data the year-round housing units as counted by the census. So that's coming up to change in, you know, in the next couple of years. So those are the basics. Affordable housing with a capital A, affordable housing with a small a, area median income, and subsidized housing inventory. If you know those, you could be an expert in affordable housing. Because right? <laughs> this is what everyone talks about. In one shape or form, it all comes down to these. Um, so for Lexington, Lexington has many affordable housing resources. Um, CPA is, of course, a great resource. And to date, town meeting has appropriated, in total, $72 million for CPA, which is just a fabulous resource. Um, and 15% of that, or just over $11 million, was for affordable housing or community housing. They call it community housing in the CPA legislation, but uh, it would be affordable housing as well. Uh, also have the Lexington Housing Authority and LexHab. Those are both local agencies that own and operate rental housing for low-income tenants. Um, we have municipal resources. There they are there. Excellent. The uh, town staff and the Lexington Housing Partnership. Those groups do a lot of work to further affordable housing and to support the efforts of the town. And then here we are, the uh, RHSO. We have a website that's useful for uh, looking up detailed inventory. Like if you wanted to look in, for the Lexington affordable housing inventory, you could look on our website and you would see it there. Or if you were someone who's looking for affordable housing in our encatchment area, you could look at that website as well. Lexington is part of the Home Consortium. That's a group of communities that receive federal funds through the Home Program. Uh, Lexington's been a member since, I think, 2006, and has received $600,000 worth of federal funds and have used those for a number of projects. I think four, and we're just working on that fourth one now. And then private property owners. We don't think of them in our sort of public resources, but through uh, the zoning that they participated and received permits under, 
they create affordable housing that way, and then the 40B developments like Avalon, you know, of course, that they are providing housing for many affordable tenants through their developments. So lots of good resources here. Um, and of course, because there's so much information and data available, like it's, it's, you can't do one of these presentations without, you know, cut and pasting some chart. So I had to have my chart out here. So this is a median sales price for the for calendar years. And I think that, uh, you know, Julie covered this very well. So I'll just point to the comments that I have to the, to the right. So in looking at um, the current information, the median income in Lexington is $153,000. Now, in the way medians work, right, there's a lot more above and there's a lot under. Um, and that translates to a sales price of $559,000. So if you made that much money gross income, that's what you could think to afford in terms of a house. Um, and if you look at it the other way, the median sales price of $1.1 million requires $251,000. So there's really $100,000 of affordability gap when you look at it that way in terms of the... Uh, the median income of where people are in Lexington now, and then the median sales price. And this is a chart about um, Lexington's housing inventory on the SHI. So you know, I can use that shorthand because you're all experts now. You all know that term is. Uh, so Lexington SHI has 11.11%. .11%. And because this is such a precise counting, they always go out two decimal places. That's what everyone talks. Uh, and that turns into 1,327 units. And the way the state counts those um, is they, back, back in the day when they created this SHI, was quite some time ago, uh, they wanted to encourage rental housing to be developed outside the city areas. So they said, I know. We will add, like if you create rental housing and 25% of it is affordable, we'll let you count all of the units on the SHI. So when you have you know, your Avalon project, only 25% of them are actually being lived in by tenants who you know, fall into the affordable housing, but all the units count on the SHI. So in fact, when you look at this, SHI number for Lexington, half the units on the SHI are actually market rate units. So when you think, wow, we're 11.11%, .11%, it really, most of that is market rate units that are counting because that's the state's counting methodology. So that's always just something to, uh, to bear in mind. So if the market rate units were removed, then the percentage actually drops to 5.63%. So, um, but the state doesn't count it that way, so that's a good thing for you to know. But it just means when you're over the 10%, you're, I'm just going to say you're not done, but that's just showing my advocacy, you know, because I'm in this line of work, right? So, um, but uh, it's just less than you thought. So back to the SHI. So, um, you know, most of it's family, and I call it family, it's not really a good term, but it's not an age-restricted unit. There's no good catchy phrase for that yet. So we have senior housing, which is really age restricted, and 24% are that, 70% are family, and six are what I call special needs. Um, so here's another little nuance. Maybe this is too much, but I'll just say it anyway. So this SHI percentage has really been stable for a decade, at least. So Lexington started the decade with 1,320, 1,320 units on the SHI, and now it's 1,327. That's like a net plus of seven. But there's been a lot of activity. Um, there have been 20 units created through private development, required by zoning. LexHab and the Lexington Housing Authority have created 17 units. But also what's counted on the SHI are beds in group homes that are being leased in private residences through the Department of Mental Health. 
And those aren't units that you go out and say, I'm creating this affordable housing and I'm going to get it on my SHI. You really don't know where those beds are. And those are really kept very confidential. And over this decade, Lexington's lost 30 of those leases. So all your good efforts have been subtracted out by something that you have no control over. So, you know, I just thought I'd point that out. Just it's another part of this counting. Some of it you have control, some of it you don't. Um, there are 63 uh, group home beds on your SHI now. So if you say, how many might we lose in the future? You could lose 63, unlikely, but um, I think it used to be 90, 93 back in the day. But when I say back in the day, it's like the first SHI report I have for you, you know, so back in my day. <laughs> um, so what's coming up for you? Now this is just, when I say what is known, because there's a lot of things that might be coming up that aren't really ready for prime time to be here in your presentation. But these are things that you probably already know about. We talked about that the denominator for this SHI, I mentioned that before, that that's going to change with the census. Um, development units um, on Grove Street, um, Jefferson Drive, it's going to be called from the marketing perspective. There are going to be three uh, affordable home ownership units coming there. And our group is going to be doing the affordable housing lottery for those. So that's always very exciting. Um, Farm View, I think that's the new name for BUSA. You might know it as BUSA. Uh, Lex have, they're going to be going forward with those six rental units. Uh, there's this other Bedford Street. You probably know more about that than I. National Development, you know probably about that as well. Um, the other kind of work that goes on is preservation work. And I just put this out because last year, was it last year? Maybe a little bit, a year, year and a half ago now, um, Lexington spent considerable resource, both financially and time resource, uh, preserving what was known as uh, Pine Grove, though some people know it as Judge's Way. So I think town meeting authorized a million dollars to put to that, and now those are perpetually restricted units. Um, some by the housing authority bought five of those units, and the rest were converted from co-op to condo. And another project that has a preservation opportunity, perhaps in the future, would be Katahdin Woods, where there are two, 102 units where the developer has the option of converting to market rate under some other kinds of restrictions and agreements with the town. Um, but it's a, it's a potential future preservation opportunity. Um, and, so I know that you're working hard on what I call inclusionary zoning, but and I think Matt's going to talk a little bit more about this, perhaps, of, uh, of requiring affordable components in your, you might call them public benefit zoning, I'm not, I'm not sure, um, but requiring affordable housing in your zoning. And I just wanted to throw in there that there are some best practices that are always good to uh, ensure that the zoning is clear so that when the developer comes forward, they understand the expectation and you get what you intended out of the zoning and you get the units that you were hoping for. Through zoning is another opportunity to think about uh, moderate income units. So this would be uh, workforce housing, sometimes people call that, 100% AMI, 120, it's where that missing middle is another term that people use. So not the low income and not the market rate, which is here, but you have this big gap as we look before that $100,000 affordability gap, providing units in there. And you could do that in your zoning as a great place to, to offer that. I've seen some communities where if you have denser development, you have to provide lower income housing, but if it was less dense, you could provide moderate income housing. So you could play with the density bonus versus the affordability. Just to say, you know, some ideas. So in summary, so uh, you know you have uh, active housing efforts, as I mentioned, and um, escalating property values make affordable housing expensive to construct, right? I think that that's kind of a 
you know, a summary statement. Um, you're, not, you're not alone in your neighboring communities, um, but through all sorts of planning initiatives, you can really prioritize programs to keep seniors and res other residents in their homes. The comprehensive plan effort that's going on and the housing production plan are great vehicles to bring forward ideas to come up with a work plan to address some of your needs. So thank you very much. Hi there, I'm Chris Clutchman. Julie's going to help me try and get my presentation up, and while she's doing that, I'll just give you a brief introduction. Um, I work for DHCD, so on Liz's really great glossary of terms, that's the State Housing and Community Development Office, uh, and I run a program called the Housing Choice Initiative. Um, I'm going to talk to you guys about statewide data, um, just to give you a sense of what's going on with housing. Uh, and then I'm going to drill down and talk about some Lexington demographics. I'm going to talk a little bit about the initiative that I run, how it works, um, and some of the, the benefits. Thank you, Julie. Awesome. So I'm super lucky. Oh, and I should say, I think um, both all of our presentations are going to be available on the town's website. So I am also going to have a fair amount of data. Don't try and be scribbling down everything and catch all of it. Um, you'll be able to download it uh, soon. So I'm super lucky. I get to start my day every day thinking about this question. What's going on with the housing stock across the Commonwealth, and is it going to meet the future needs of our residents? Um, we have all sorts of different kinds of residents. Um, I happen to be a Lexington resident myself, so I'm lucky. Um, happy to be here. I, I, do, I do this presentation around the state, but it's really fun to do it here. So um, my kids went through the Lexington school system. In fact, there is um, a much younger version of my current large 17-year-old very happy at Fisk with one of his favorite teachers. I'm pretty sure that she could not afford to rent or buy a house in Lexington. And that's some of the residents that I think about, or some of the people that I think about. The lovely elder citizen in the red sweater um, in Christmas out, out, outfit is my mom. My mom um, lived with us for the last 10 years of her life. She lived to be 94, which was great. Um, but when you're over 85, you have really specific housing needs. And one of the things that's happening in our, um, uh, across the country, but also in Massachusetts, is we're all getting older and we're also living a lot longer. And the number of people over age 85 is growing all the time, which is great. We have great medical care. That's wonderful. But we, if you're an elder citizen, you have specific housing needs. So one of the main issues across the state, uh, and this slide is showing you by decade the amount of housing production that's gone on. If you've ever heard Governor Baker speak about housing, you've heard him literally articulate this chart. Between the 60s, 70s, and 80s, we used to average about 30,000 housing units a year. Um, in the last three decades, we've dropped to about half of that. Uh, here on this chart, multifamily is in blue and single family is in the light blue. So that's just, it, it is in some sense a supply and demand issue, and our, uh, in the last generation, our supply has dropped. Just taking a more nuanced look at this, this is year by year, for those of you who want to get really detailed. Um, and again, we have um, similar multifamily in dark and single family in light. Um, one of the things that's here on this slide is we have two family and three and four family units. And as you can see across Massachusetts, even back in the day when we were producing you know, 35,000 units a year, there are very few of this housing type um, that have been built, certainly in the, uh, recently in the last decade or so. Um, Liz talked about the missing middle in terms of income. There's also a missing middle in terms of housing type, and that's duplexes and triplexes and quads. Um, a really rather moderate housing um, stock that we're not building so much anymore um, and that can house some, and can really is very suitable for some of our, um, our housing needs for elder people, for young families. So what happens when you don't have a big supply is the markets get pretty tight. And this is looking at uh, vacancy rates for ownership units. And again, this is across the state. Um, and it is looking at, uh, and, and I've kind of put um, at a healthy vacancy rate for ownership units is about two, is considered to be about 
I've highlighted Middlesex County here, but all of the counties across the state um, are shown. And you can see Middlesex County is below 1%. Um, and so uh, we're, we're definitely um, short on our supply. And again, anybody who's uh, dealt with realtors or knows realtors, you, you'll hear them talk about lack of inventory. We have lack of supply, lack of inventory. And the same is true for rental. Um, some of our more recreational counties, um, the Berkshires and the Cape, um, have higher rental rates and um, higher vacancies. But again, a kind of metric to use uh, in the market is that 6% um, rental vacancy is healthy, and we are below that. Um, so when you have lack of supply and you have uh, low, um, not a lot of vacancies, one of the things that happens is the prices go up. Unfortunately for Massachusetts, this is a place where it is not good to be number one. <laughs> Unfortunately, um, the bottom chart is rentals, and this is just from last month. We were the highest rental rates across the country of any state. This is 50 states, um, and we are the highest. And the state average last February was about $2,500. Um, the home value is a little bit older data, um, but we're behind California and Hawaii. Um, we've gone past New York, and we left them in the dust. Um, they're uh, a couple over. Um, so we are really experiencing um, very, very high uh, uh, rates. Um, for our housing stock. The other thing, I mean, so, the, so that's kind of about how does it affect all of us, right? We're, you're, you're faced with um, not a lot of places, a lot, not a lot of inventory that you can choose from. Um, you're faced with very <coughs> high prices if you're trying to um, move or, or, or move around um, or even get into the market for the first time. But housing costs really affect our economy as well. Um, and it's an economic development issue that's very serious. So this chart looks at metro areas. So it says Boston, Mass, but these are all metropolitan areas. Like, so Lexington is part of this Boston metropolitan area. And this is looking at the number of building permits for new housing that are issued per 1,000 residents. And look at Massachusetts is just over two units per 1,000, but Austin is over 10. What happens is that these competing metro areas, and again, as the state competes for different economic development projects, as we compete to bring businesses to our economy, um, these are the, the areas that we're competing against, and we are losing out, and this bottom half is metro to metro migration, and you can see the Massachusetts and the lower, um, per, the, the areas that are permitting less housing are losing in metro to metro migration. So for example, for every uh, three people that move to Boston, the Boston metro area from Portland, Oregon, which is on the left side of that chart, we send them 10 people, okay? So sometimes this is, you. sometimes you think about this as like, this is my kids, my kids can't live here, and they're moving to these places, and sometimes it's, um, companies that want to build here say, you know what, I think I'm going to go to Austin because it's, you know, there's a lot more housing there and, you know, I can really, my employees can, if I'm going to move my factory from Cleveland somewhere else, um, Boston just doesn't enter into the mix because the housing prices are so high. And so businesses are pretty outspoken about this. Um, you're starting to hear more and more that these are major concerns of business groups um, and that they're having trouble both recruiting and retaining employees because of high housing prices. And what gets mixed here is that it's housing and transportation, because if you can't afford to live near your job, you end up moving further away. New Hampshire has some less expensive housing, uh, less expensive cost of living, um, and they're kind of the number one place that people go, but also people are going further away from um, the job bases that are here. So the folks that do, and I don't do this kind of work um, because it's a lot of math, and I'm pretty mathy, but I'm not this mathy. Um, there's a real science to projecting where is new housing going to be needed. It's based on population increases. It's based on job and employment projections. And really the Metro Boston, and this is, again, for this um, projection, Metro Boston here is very large, as you can see. But that is pretty much where all of the new housing needs to be built in the state. Um, so we are in the uh, in the hot spot for places that um, need more housing to house both our workers um, and our uh, and new people who are moving here, as well as well our own children. So you heard Liz talk about cost burden. Thank you so much for setting that up because now you're all experts. Um, this slide is is my most depressing slide. So really, from here, it's going to get a little bit better. Um, but I'm, this is showing cost burden in yellow, 
and severely cost burden in this kind of brown colored. And severely cost burden is when you're paying more than 50% of your household income for housing. Uh, and this is statewide. We have homeowners on the left and renters on the right, and it's organized by income grouping. Um, so first of all, there are 500,000 people that are severely cost burdened, whether you're owning or renting, and that's just not okay. Um, but you can see in all of the income ranges, people are cost burdened. And if you look at this data over time and compare it to, let's say, like 2000, we are seeing large increases in the amount of people that are becoming cost burdened. I think it's 50% um, it's for uh, ownership and 56% increase over time since 20, 2000 in renters. Okay, so now I get to answer my question, and luckily I get to come back to my job tomorrow and try and solve it again, because the answer is no. <laughs> we are not, we do not have the housing stock um, that we need um, uh, to sustain the, the future uh, Massachusetts residents. So I'm gonna dip down now into some Lexington demographics, um, and I wanna plug the source of this, Mass Housing Partnerships Center for Housing Data, has a really neat um, website called Datatown. So for anybody else out there that really loves this stuff, I literally went to it, you can choose your town, so they have all 351 towns and cities, and with a click of a button, I downloaded this chart, like literally, like the chart <laughs> with the sources right in there. So you too can do it. So Lexington's population, this goes back to 1930, you know, had a big increase uh, after the war, like, like many places, uh, and then has been rather slow, and then recently has some, seen some upticks. And we'll get better data when the 2020 census comes. Um, again, this is using some of that American Community Service data. This chart is from the 2002-2003 Comprehensive Plan that Lexington did. How many people here remember the Comprehensive Plan from 2002-2003? What an amazing chart this was! Um, and it really tells the story that you've been hearing from Liz and from Julie, um, while, uh, and it shows um, home building in Lexington. Uh, and again, it does very detailed year by year, but as you can see, um, and then it's got this 10-year average line in it too, but Lexington's not, is constructing fewer and fewer and fewer houses, and I think what Julie's conclusion was in the last uh, eight years, seven or eight years, it's 100 units. Um, so that's just, that's not a lot. Um, okay, so that was kind of to go to the, with the population. So you see, the population's been rather steady, um, and we're not really building a lot of new housing. So now I just wanna walk you through some age demographics. Um, and I, do, I like this graphic because it just kind of reminds people about you know, the different generations that we have and how we're kind of different. Um, my kids are in this generation and like I literally, they do not use the phone feature. We're always like, can you use the phone feature? And they're like, no, I will not use the phone feature. So uh, different generations are a little bit different. So again, the baby boomers, the millennials um, is uh, generation Y. Um, that's the kind of millennial, uh, they used to be called the baby boom echo, but now they got their own name of millennials. So I'm gonna, this is gonna be a series of slides. It's, this is 1990. Um, and we have population in age groups from young to old. Um, here's the 85 plus group that I was talking about, so you might keep your eye on that, and I, I can go back and forth here. So I have 1990, 2000, 2010, and 2017, and it's kind of interesting to see what happens. So, um, and the other thing that's on this chart, if you can see it, are dotted lines. That's the state average for these um, population bands, okay? So here, Lexington, um, had kind of less younger people um, in that kind of 20 to 30 year bracket, but otherwise, and was a little bit older than the state, okay? Boy, between 1990 and 2000, there just really a, a severe drop in that young population. Um, and then again, the population continued to be older than the state, and you can pretty much see, I, I don't have an explanation for what happened <laughs> to that, to those people between 1990 and 2000, but it's a pretty big drop. And again, everybody else just kind of goes older, right? That's generally what's gonna happen is people are gonna get older. Um, in 2010, that again, that severe dip dropped, but now um, we're seeing the kind of child, um, more children than the state as a whole. And so we see school-aged populations grow. And again, people are older, 
and again, here's our over 85 population. Again, even in the state, that group is getting um, larger, but Lexington has even, even more. And then this is, uh, sorry, went the wrong way. And then this is 27, this is the, uh, 2017. Um, and this is, again, I don't have a lot of explanation for this, and maybe this is food for thought for the comprehensive plan, but this is 2010, and this is 2017. And we're starting to lose some of the older population, uh, I notice. Um, and so that's, that's kind of interesting to me. Um, I'm not sure, again, where they've gone or why they've gone, but things to think about. And again, like I started by saying, you know, I, I bring housing down to the people. Um, I started with the pictures because I th like to think about people, and I think the age demographics are a pretty um, compelling story when you think about housing. Um, so just to reiterate what you've already heard, um, Lexington is well over 60% of um, single family, uh, very different, you know, well beyond the state average, and very few of the 10 units and more. Um, so again, and then there's that missing middle that I talked about, very few of the products that are um, uh, duplexes, uh, triplexes, and quads. I feel very brave to put up the slide. <laughs> I know you got the last comprehensive plan meeting, uh, you, there was a big session about school enrollment and school enrollment projections. Um, those are very, uh, very, very smart people. This is actually just a snapshot of what has happened from in the past. So these are the school uh, um, enrollments from 2017 backwards. I don't know what happened in 2004, but somebody forgot to hit send with the email, but um, this is all from the state mass education department. Um, and the, the light blue here is the public school attendance, and then the other things um, are regional schools, uh, charter schools, private schools, and homeschools. So not, not a lot of that, and again, probably the, the biggest interest here. And so if you remember the population slide, you can see that you know, Lexington's population recently has gone up, and this really kind of mirrors it. It's not radical school enrollment growth. Um, it is interesting to see that the school enrollment is going up, but yet no new housing has happened. So what I can conclude from this is that Lexington's school enrollment is going up. It is not a result of new housing. So what can Lexington do? Well, you've done some good planning. Uh, you have the, comprehensive, the housing production plan that's being updated. Um, there are policy statements in there that um, wanted you to look at um, inclusionary zoning, uh, wanted you to look at uh, to dedicate monies from the CPA, which I think uh, you've done, and consider some zoning changes. Uh, also in the, the housing element where I found this um, great uh, chart, um, there were uh, policy directions explore um, allowing higher densities in uh, near retail goods and transportation. And I think the example of this that happened through town meeting approval was the Lexington Place development that replaced the inn, the old inn that was downtown and now we have the apartments and the great bike cafe. Um, that's Lexington Place. That is an example of this policy statement that was envisioned in 2002, 2003. Um, and then looking at um, converting other um, non-residential units into residential use. Like the Hancock School, like the Muzzy School, that kind of thing. All right, now I'm going to turn away from Lexington for a minute and just tell you a little bit about the state and the Baker Polito administration's thinking on this, which is, okay, we have, beginning of my presentation, we have a big problem. Um, how, what are we going to do? So um, Governor Baker and his uh, staff, and actually across multiple agencies, came up with a housing choice initiative. He set a goal for 135,000 net new housing units by 2025 statewide. Um, he created a program with a housing choice where you designate communities who reach certain policy goals and then have grants available um, for them and other special considerations with other capital grants. Um, I'm the other, another hat I wear is I, wor uh, I work amongst um, mostly towns and city staff like Carol and Julie and with people like Liz to help coordinate technical assistance and so people understand all of the grants and opportunities that the state has that can help support new housing or help you think about new housing or zoning or whatever it is that you need. Uh, and then also um, the governor has filed legislation. He filed it a year ago and he has just filed it again about two weeks ago. So the goal of 135,000 um, new units basically kind of straight lines the last couple of years where we have been seeing a little bit higher production. It's about 17,000 units a year over the next eight years. So one of the things I do is I, I track that carefully. 
Um, so I de um, we've designated housing choice communities, and last year the, in that the first class was 69 communities. These are all communities that are producing housing. They had either a 5% increase in net new housing units over the last five years, or a 3% increase with a whole slate of best practices in their zoning. So Lexington was under 1% increase in the last five years, so you're not going to qualify for the program that I run. Um, but that's okay. We're, gonna, we're up here to help you with technical assistance and, and help uh, support the um, efforts of the staff. We also created a program to provide grants for small towns, and it's a little hard to see on the slide, but as you can see, um, small towns under 7,000, many of them to the west, um, where the market is not um, demanding housing, um, there's no ultimate need for housing production, and we have a grant program that allows them to, it encourages them to produce um, new housing units, especially affordable housing units, um, through capital grants. I did put the best practices that are part of my program into this presentation. I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time going through them. Um, I leave them with you all. Um, to say if you if Lexington wants to start seeing new housing production, these are all ways to do that. Some of them are financial mechanisms, which you've are, you're already doing. Um, you dedicate monies to housing. Um, you know, you you spend Community Preservation Act. And many of them are zoning related uh, and suggestions for zoning. And then some of them are tax related. Um, so there are a whole bunch of um, a variety of tax, uh, there, there's um, tax programs that you can do that really create housing. Um, and then there are other tax programs that are aimed at relieving seniors from uh, tax burdens, from property tax burdens. And I think Lexington is exploring those. I mean, I think there are even some on the warrant um, that I saw. There's, there's like six things on the warrant, I think, um, for consideration. So those are all good practices to do. Um, so again, I put these here not to tell you what to do, but just to kind of um, leave you um, with things to think about. Um, part of the, the incentive-based part of the program that I run is to encourage communities to build more housing so they can qualify for grants. So I got to give away $5 million last year. These are the communities that did that. Um, most of this is going to infrastructure to support new housing, um, stormwater improvements, new sewer systems. Uh, infrastructure to build, uh, the town of Egremont all the way in western Massachusetts is building its first four affordable units ever um, and we gave them money to build driveways and a septic system. So again, all around the state, all sorts of different programs, but basically capital money to support um, new residents and, and housing production. So uh, Governor Baker on February 27th, um, just uh, refiled this legislation, which is called an Act to Promote Housing Choices. Um, it would change Chapter 40A, which is called the Zoning Act in Massachusetts. Um, and it basically says that for a certain set of zoning amendments, if you, if you have zoning amendments that are going to increase housing production, instead of needing a two-thirds majority at town meeting, you would drop to a 51% simple majority. So it's kind of an exception to the rule in 40A that says that to do any zoning amendment, you need a two-thirds majority. So if somebody wanted to change a light industrial parcel to heavy industrial, still needs two-thirds majority. But if you wanted to reduce lot sizes for zoning, or you wanted to reduce uh, parking requirements for multifamily, 51% vote instead of two-thirds. Okay. Um, there are a couple other provisions to the bill, um, including if you allow, if you have transit-oriented development that allows for multifamily and includes, um, and and you get a project with a, um, affordability, the special permit can drop to a simple majority as well. <laughs> So I don't want to leave you too depressed. Um, there are lots of fantastic examples all around the state of people doing really innovative zoning and innovative um, approaches to creating housing. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these, but I'll just highlight a couple. Um, West Newbury, I and this is a very small rural town up near the New Hampshire border in Essex County, they identified a need for starter homes. And so they added a provision in their uh, subdivision rules called open space residential development that said if you do a starter home subdivision and you you deed restrict the housing units to 1500 square feet and not more then you can do double the amount of units in that subdivision and they and then and they got a developer who built that and those are you know units that are not more than 1500 square feet that size restriction not an income restriction not income limited not capital a affordable 
there, that's going to keep these housing unit prices somewhat suppressed. It wasn't a mandate by the town, but it was an option that had a density bonus attached to it. Um, Devons is nearby, and they're redeveloping new neighborhoods, and they have some really interesting zoning to encourage um, neighborhoods like this. And if you're ever out at Devons for a conference or something, you, and, or um, there are lots of soccer, uh, soccer and frisbee tournaments there, um, take a look at this Emerson Gardens. This is a mix of duplexes and single families that feels like a single family neighborhood. Every single um, building has a porch, and I went through to take some pictures there, and somebody really came out and said, can I help you? <laughs> so it's really a neighborhood feel, and their zoning actually really helped promote that. Again, you guys are part of my best practices. Uh, and again, many other communities are donating land and giving things and doing things um, that, that work. So I leave that with you really to um, give you the sense of if you want to spend time and do some more research, um, those are some best practices. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm Matt Dag, I was introduced earlier. Uh, first, I want to thank you for sitting through three presentations already. I try, I'm trying to take too much time here, but uh, thank you for this time this evening. So um, I'm a member of the Comprehensive Plan Advisory Committee, and um, I, I was asked to put together some charts on something that I kind of follow in my spare time as a Lexington resident. It's actually one of the reasons I ended up getting into town government in the first place. Uh, and that's on the subject of teardown. So I'm going to talk about that. So this is all going to be focused on Lexington because we've kind of got the broad brush. I uh, will talk about some specific issues uh, in, in the town and maybe some things that we can do about that. So the first thing I just kind of want to start off with definitions, much like everyone else. So you know, at the bottom I've got kind of the you know the internet definition of a teardown, but it's it's basically the act or process of you know taking something apart or demolishing it. In this case, you think of housing. You know, taking down a housing and, and off of the larger building. So here's an example off of the Phillip Road, uh, where the process of a uh, house being torn down over over several days. Uh, so we already <laughs> saw this chart earlier, but one of the things I find really interesting about this is if you look at the 1950s, we're building three to four hundred houses per year, and that's that's kind of tremendous. Uh, you can see it, it starts to tail off. We also saw this one as well, this inflection point between when vacant lots and you know, subdivisions uh, start to tail off and the, the teardowns become the new source uh, for, how, for how we create buildable lots in town. Um, all that kind of goes into uh, this next point is if you think about making so much of that housing in the 50s, you know, the average age of a single family home in Lexington is about 64 years old. Um, so something that you know is a counterpoint to that is the tremendous rise in the median house price uh, within Lexington. So every few years there'll be a study on this and Lexington will come out top as the greatest you know, increase in the greater metro area uh, for house price. But here's just an ex a statistic I pulled, uh, you know, I like nice even numbers. So 2009 to 2019, um, we went from $627,000 median uh, to 1.49 million. So that's an increase of 237,000. So what this sets up is, we have housing that's aging, right? That's 64 years average age. Probably has a lot of deferred maintenance. Again, we saw the population demographics getting older, right? We've probably been in those homes a long time. Yet the prices are sky high. And this puts a lot of pressure on those. If you think about people coming in and, and wanting to buy those houses as is, they probably require a lot of work. And from the financial standpoint, it's probably out of the means of a lot of folks who probably could afford to buy the house, but can't afford to do the work to make it you know, um, a more livable and up-to-date home. So I'm going to be talking about uh, a measurement which we call in the zoning world gross floor area, but it's a little bit different than when you think of, of, of living area. So if you've ever looked at a real estate listing, you see how much square footage a house has. That's what we're really talking about, the living area of the house. The zoning defi definition is a little bit different. 
um, it grows floor area is essentially the sum of all the floor areas on each level. So in this uh, little diagram here, you think about all the area in a basement, first and second floor, and in Lexington we have these half stories where you can count a certain percentage of it uh, underneath that portion of the roof. And there's a very long zoning definition of what are all the different areas that are included. It really doesn't matter. But just thinking about as, you know, for the most part, it's the envelope of the building. Um, and so when you think about doing the zoning, um, the measure we use is gross floor area, and that's what I'm primarily going to talk about uh, tonight. So if we take a look at all of the houses that were torn down in 2018, one of the first things we can look at is the size of the homes that were there and the size of the homes that replaced it. So the median gross floor area of the homes that were demolished was about 2,400 at 76 square feet. So that's a little bit bigger. Again, it's going to be a slightly larger number than living area. So that's, you know, kind of think of like a small cave uh, or a small garrison colonial is that particular size. Uh, what we replaced it with was something around 6,378 square feet, uh, which is a difference of about 258%, uh, you know, comparing these two medians. Um, I'll give you a specific example of it. So this was a, a rather large difference, right? So the house that we started with here was uh, around 1796 square foot gross floor area. Um, this was a house that's actually on our historical, well, was on our historic red, uh, cultural inventory. Um, the historical commission had decided that they wished it to be pref preferably preserved, and it had a one-year uh, moratorium on its demolition, which when it expired, uh, this house was built. So 11,317 um, gross floor area, which is a difference of about 630%. So, I mean, this is a large example, but I think the point here is that, you know, this type of new development dramatically changes the streetscape of neighborhoods. Um, it dramatically, you know, changes a lot of the areas of Lexington that have had a certain look and feel for a long time. So, um, what can you do about this? So, several years ago, uh, there was a study looking into can we restrict some of this through zoning? And town, uh, there was a study that was done, and uh, uh, an article came before town meeting, and that placed uh, residential regulations on gross floor area. So here's the complicated table that comes into the, uh, in the zoning bylaw. And in basic, what it is is determined by the size of your lot. There's a limit on how much house you can build. So kind of a kind of short way to look at it is if you look at the lot size in the left column, just look at this first number in the right column. So, you know, for a 30,000 square foot lot, you know, you can build up to 6,000 something square feet uh, with this other part of the equation on the side. Uh, so what this does is it allows you to limit the, the size of the building envelope as a function of the lot. And it's a very common tool that's used uh, in zoning in many areas. So again, I'll give you a couple examples. Um, the example on the left was um, one of the last houses that was built um, before this took effect. Um, this is actually being built as we were working on this, this bylaw. Um, but you can see on this lot, um, the house is 13,602 square foot GFA. So imagine a lot where you have the front setbacks and the side setbacks and just fill that entire lot with the house. That's essentially what you have here. Um, if you were to build that same house um, now with these regulations, uh, you could only build 7,300 or so square feet so and essentially this house was built to 185% of what is allowable today. Uh, and so that was just one of the impetus to, to, to take on this measure. So what do you see today? Um, you see a lot of houses really pushing the limit, doing very interesting and creative ways to get right at it. So here's an example of a lot. It's a very small lot that only allows uh, 5,300 or so square feet. Uh, in this case, the house was tweaked and it's designed in such a way to maximize to 99.91% of the allowable gross floor area. Um, so there's all kinds of tricks that are played to, to get with this. And one of the challenges that we have here is that basements are included um, and there's height restrictions on what is a full height basement and what is a crawl space. And um, develop, developers play all kinds of games with lowering ceilings and putting in false floors to kind of get to where they can to, to zero this number. But uh, so a large portion of homes being built today are being built right to that limit. So if we look nationally, um, and again, this chart here is, is, uh, is a national statistic, 
Uh, on the one on the left, we look at the average square foot. Now, again, this is not, this will not be gross floor area. This will be finished living area. But as we can see, kind of from the 80s on forward, houses generally are getting larger in size. But if we look at the average household size in terms of people, uh, we see a decrease, right? So we're building larger houses, but less people are living in them. Now, the red dots I've superimposed on the, on the tops here, this is kind of where Lexington is. And it's, again, finished living area. We're around 4,800 square feet um, and then about 2.9 people. So we're a little higher. Our, our, our uh, average household size has been fairly flat, kind of trending upward just a little bit kind of over the same time period. So um, the question begs is why do we keep building larger and larger houses if we're not putting more people in them? Um, one of the reasons you have to do that in Lexington is because it's expensive to develop. It's getting more and more expensive. Um, this statistic here is if you were to take a house that you acquired a lot for and you tore that down, how much did you pay per square foot of the size of that lot? So 10 years ago, in 2008, the median dollar per square foot, again, for that land was around $33. Um, if you fast forward to today, we're up around $50. So when you're spending this much money on just getting a buildable lot, you have to maximize what you can do on that lot. And a lot of that maximization that we see is size often um, because you have to lower the amount of the land acquisition cost and total you know, business performa of how you decide to take on one of these uh, housing projects. So. That has a lot of implications. Um, one of the things we see a lot is, uh, and I'll talk about next, is the difference between public and private sales. So public sale would be, you go uh, look at a real estate brokerage site, you see all these different houses for sale, you can you know, go over there with your agent, take a look and buy one. Um, one of the things that we see a lot now, so a lot of teardowns were bought in this such way. Um, developers would go and they would buy a house that was on the market, and and just like an end user would build a fine house. One of the things we're seeing a lot today is private sales. Um, for, for example, if lot um, costs are increasing, you want to try to do whatever you can to minimize that. Uh, how can you get a deal in this particular environment? And one of the ways to do that is to try and get property so that it doesn't go on the market, so that there isn't competition for that same lot. Um, you want to be able to lock that up yourself. So here's an example of an ad that we often see. These probably run every few weeks in the local newspapers uh, from various builders you know, telling you um, that they're looking for buildable lands, they're looking for teardowns. And they give these attributes that um, should be, you know, to try and entice people to sell in a private sale. For example, I'll pay above market value for all buildable land, no real estate commission involved. Again, you know, sale of a house, it's about 5%, 2.5% to either broker. Um, and convenient hassle-free closings, so that you don't have to wait a long period of time. Often these are all cash transactions. Um, a lot of, some folks will even advertise that they'll bulldoze it with your stuff in it. Um, so we try to make it as easy as possible for you to make that decision. So there's a lot of tactics here in trying to get these. Um, these are in the newspapers. You will get these in the mail, especially in a lot of the neighborhoods that have smaller homes. Um, some people will go door to door, some people will call. Again, there's, a, 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 there's just such a, um, you know, insatiable demand for buildable lots. Um, but there's also another piece here that kind of ties in uh, with the real estate brokers. So these private sales, you would think, well, this is, you know, people would be up in arms about this. We're, we're brokers. This is what, you know, we're, this is our job. This is what we're meant to do. We're meant to connect people with housing opportunities that they can buy. And so one of the things that we see a lot uh, now is that there is a, essentially a partnership between um, certain real estate brokers and developers. And so how this works is um, I would have a house say I wanted to sell. I would go to a real estate broker and I would say, you know, based on the age and how much you know, work that your house needs to do, it's probably a teardown. So I'm not going to represent you. I, it's probably not your best interest to list your house on the market. But what I'll do is I'll tell some of the developers I know um, and, and they'll give you good offers and maybe you'll get one. Um, often what they don't disclose is that when one of those developers buys that land and then develops a new house, the agent that brought them that connection then gets to list the new home. Mm -hmm. So there's not a lot of incentive to list a house for $500,000 and then get a 2.5% commission 
when you can list a, a house for $2 million and get 2.5% of that. And so um, this has a lot of issues for a lot of the different things we've talked about in terms of demographics. There's a whole section of the inventory that never makes it to the market. No one can ever have the opportunity to buy the, the opportunity to rehab those homes, to turn them into affordable housing or turn them into small family homes. Um, because of the private sales, those just opportunities uh, don't come up. And the other piece of this is that, uh, and I, I'm sure you'll see this talking with your neighbors and, and, um, and others around town, is that you just get this perception of the eventuality that your house is a teardown. Um, people just assume that their 50s cape is completely unsaleable and that this is a foregone conclusion, and I don't think it's not. It is. So there's some other things that kind of go along with this. Um, this was some studies that were done during the uh, Residential Policy Committee study several years ago. But one of the things it found is if you looked over several years at all of the housing that was produced, or new single-family housing that was produced, 74% of it was produced. Uh, through a mechanism of teardown. And of that 74%, 76% of those properties were acquired through private sales. Oh, wow. So it's, it really is the large majority. The other piece here is, is digging into the claim of the, the top dollar, right? So on the statistic on the left, if we look at, it's hard to compare you know, the speculative value of property, but one of the things we can compare it to is the assessed value of property that is, you know, assesses all of our real estate tax bills. There's a very rigorous method that goes into figuring out how much property and additions are worth. So we can use that as a baseline to compare against. So for example, houses that were sold uh, and then torn down in private sales, uh, in this case, uh, had a median of about 8% over the town's assessed value. Now when we look at the median of owners who sold their homes in public sales, it was 21%. So you can see even when you wrap in the broker's fees and the convenience of, you know, of, of having an immediate uh, all-cash closing um, and not having to deal with that, uh, there's still money being left on the table. And you can see this is one of the reasons why uh, there is such an aggressive market to go after a private acquisition versus on-the-market acquisition because it, it limits the profitability uh, of these uh, future homes. So for example, uh, if we look at just this year, uh, there's other implications as well. So here's two different versions. This is the smallest home that was built in 2018 and the largest. So the one on the left uh, is around 3,900 square foot GFA. You have a pretty modest sized house. That house sold for 1.57 million. Uh, and when you look at the tax bill that's associated with that uh, in FY19 taxes, it's about $20,000 per year. Now if we look at this large house here, this was the largest one that was built in 2018. Again, 11,000 uh, 11, uh, square foot GFA, 2.65 million, uh, 33,000, almost $34,000 tax bill. So this has a lot of implications for the longevity of this housing. Um, I know there are some folks that have moved in my own neighborhood who have told me that um, they are only here until their kids graduate Lexington High School because the taxes are too high. So these are not homes that people are going to retire in at the, at the rate at which the tax bill is going. Um, so, you know, that says some, a lot about um, the transitive nature of our community as we continue to build more and more of these, and we're doing about 70 of these a year. Um, so if you think about it, it really just starts to change, you know, uh, just the, I guess, the conception of how long people will live here and why, you know, what may bring people here and under what circumstances. So the last thing I want to leave you with is kind of the cumulative effect of all of this and maybe some ideas of what, what are some things that we can do to change this. Um, so in the past 20 years, if you look at all of the teardowns that have happened in town, it's essentially replaced about 14% of the entire inventory in the past 20 years. So if you kind of think of that trajectory, we have about 9,030 single family homes in town. You think we're doing about 70 of these a year, and you can kind of see what the, the landscape of the town is changing year by year. So what are some things that we can do um, to maybe shape this or, you know, uh, some of the effects of this? Uh, some examples are stricter zoning and dimensional controls. Now, we talked about one here. That was the regulation of gross floor area. There's some other um, parts of the zoning toolkit that we haven't used, um, site coverage, 
maybe uh, we talked earlier about you know more increased setbacks and other types of things. There's a careful balance here, right? Because you want people to be able to own a home and expand it in a reasonable way. Um, but right now, essentially, the, the future of the housing in town is being driven by the market, it's being driven by you know what maximizes certain certain value propositions, and that doesn't necessarily make make the housing that we want. Um, you could do other aggressive things. You could think about maybe a surcharge on demolition permits. Again, you have to figure out some careful way to do this so that you have homeowners not getting affected. I know someone who lived in a very small house. When they had enough uh, money, they demolished their own house and built a new one on their same lot, and they stayed in this town. They wanted to make something more modern for a growing family. Um, but speculative development, um, that may be a little bit different. Um, thinking about incentive programs for uh, rehabbing of older properties. Um, so if you look at the economics of it, how much you spend for that, for the lot acquisition, the land is so valuable, um, it, it really doesn't, it, you don't make as much money by just make, you know, gut renovating that house and then reselling it. Again, in Lexington, turnkey uh, property is, is really the value here, not necessarily extremely large homes. Um, some other things you could think about, there's several communities that are looking at uh, real estate transfer fees on high value homes. So um, these, you could say you could have a threshold of say $2 million. Um, once that threshold is meet, every time uh, there's a transaction of that, the initial transaction of that home from the developer to a homeowner, there is a, uh, there is a fee, that is, a large fee that is assessed. And what's interesting about the communities you're looking at is they're using this as a way, again this would take you know, a home rule petition uh, within the government to do this, but they're looking at this as a way to create a fund to create affordable housing. So you have this transfer fee on these speculative developments, and then you use that money to create affordable housing in the same town. And then other things, like uh, was mentioned earlier, tax policies. Um, the residential exemption is one thing that's being looked at right now as a way to shift some of the tax burden uh, up to maybe potentially higher income properties away from the lower income properties. So relieving some of the pressure on seniors. Uh, again, well, you know, if you can afford a $2.6 million home, maybe you can afford a higher tax bill. So a lot of these things are, are being looked at in multiple communities, as well as uh, in Lexington as well. And so the last thing I'll leave you with is that you know, each of these you have to think carefully about. Um, you know, there are a lot of other communities that have tried to get on top of this. Um, Newton really kind of comes to mind. They had used every zoning control, dimensional control they could think of, and they couldn't, you know, um, kind of stop the, the amount of teardowns that were happening. They got to the point where they were almost going to propose a, a moratorium on teardowns. Um, but they had these things where, you know, the developers found out that detached structures were not included in the GFA, so they started building all the detached garages, and they go, and they have to change that. So it's just kind of constant cat and mouse game. Um, other ones have to do with uh, partial demolitions. You do a full demolition that has certain things, but if you do a partial demolition, like you're going to expand a home, that has a different set of criteria. And so I'll give you an example of that. We want to be careful about that as well. Here's two Lexington examples. Um, the one on the top, this is on Waltham Street. You can go see this right now. So the original home here is in white, and the, the expansion of that home is uh, the part in green on the left. And not only is it being expanded to the left, you can see here it's also being expanded out of, out of the rear. I think this will be almost two, the, the addition is two-thirds the size of the, of the original home here. Um, and this will be a two-family home. Here's another example on the bottom. If you look at the front view of this, you almost wouldn't see that this is a, you'd think this is a kind of a normal, like kind of 1950s charming cave. But there's a whole house kind of growing off the back of it. And if you look at it from the rear, you can see there is, you know, essentially this three and a half story structure um, that, is, that is, is quite looming. So there are some you know, bonuses to this. Maybe the streetscape is a little more maintained because you, you have the, you know, the frontage here of the, um, of the cape. That hasn't necessarily changed. But you have another very large home, so you're not really doing anything for having that diversity of housing type, having more affordable housing, um, and so forth. So you have to think very carefully about whatever mechanisms you choose to try and get at this. It's a, it's a very hard problem. Uh, the market forces are extremely strong, um, and especially here where we depend so much on residential tax bases, we start talking about reducing, you know, potentially encumbering the tax revenue. Uh, it gets a lot of people excited. <laughs> That's all I have.
for uh, sticking with us through the presentations. Um, we're going to do some question and answer sessions right now. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and we'll bring you one of the microphones. We're going to bring the microphone to you so you don't have to get it. No, but that's really we, I'm glad you are excited. <laughs> Okay, so I'll start with There, uh, my name is Taylor Singh. I'm a town meeting member. I'm also on the Special Permit Residential Development Ad Hoc Bylaw Amendment Committee, something like that. Um, my first question, I have a couple, um, is for Ms. Ross. Um, so how do developers make money off of affordable units? So if, uh, Hypothetically, if I started a new subdivision in Lexington and I built two homes and both are worth a million dollars and one of them is going to be deemed a, an affordable home, how do I make money off that? So with, um, with developments like that where there's a private development and it's by zoning, there has to be enough market rate units to cover the cost. All affordable housing is built at a loss. That's just like the basic piece. So you can either fund that subsidy required, that's another way of talking about it, where the cost is here and you're gonna get this much back. You can either fund that through the market rate units that you're getting the density bonus, or if you have a higher percentage of affordable units, you're looking for some subsidies like CPA funds or state funds. So a lot of the nonprofit agencies that are building 100% affordable housing, or 50% of the units are affordable, or something like that, they're always getting some public money. Uh, thank you, and then um, with that public money, um, how much would they get back on their investment into that home? So if it would sell for a million dollars in the market, I mean... Every project's gonna be different based on whether it's rental or it's ownership and how many units and what per unit subsidy is going into the development. So there's no rule of thumb on that, but every request for subsidy, the financials are always carefully reviewed by the funder. And no one's gonna fund where the per unit development uh, cost is too high or the developer's gonna get back too much of a profit. The 40B limit on profit for ownership is 20%, but there's different, uh, different kinds of measures. 20% is the limit of profit. Okay. Yes, in affordable, in a 40B legislation. Okay. But that's just one kind right. of project. Okay. Um, sorry, I'll keep you on the hot seat. Um, but both you and Ms. Kletchman spoke about inclusionary zoning. Mm -hmm. um, and I understand that Wellesley isn't one of the towns that you cover, but they do have an inclusionary zoning bylaw. Um, would you be able to speak to what that encompasses or what one of the towns that you have so um, when I use inclusionary zoning, I use it with like a small I because it comes in different flavors. And what I mean by that is through local permitting, you're requiring an affordable unit. <laughs> and that local permitting can be any number of bylaws. Sometimes inclusionary is you know across the entire town and all the residents. For every eight units, one has to be affordable, something like that. Um, those affordable units are regulated under the state LIP program, and in that way they will all look the same from a regulatory aspect, but uh, under the particular bylaws of the town, they might be a little different. That's so I don't know about Wellesley's particular bylaw. But I know here at Lexington that the, um, the Grove Street or Jefferson Drive, those units came out of uh, what I would call those inclusionary units as well as the ones on Manor House that were just sold, um, and um, I think other ones coming up. Yeah, I, I was just gonna add that inclusionary can be mandatory, um, like Liz said, or it can be um, at the choice of the developer. So you get additional density if you choose to have a public benefit like affordable housing. Um, so it's that's not requiring them to do that. They could just do <clears throat> the basic zoning but if there's an, an incentive. And so that's, again, how the finances work. But it's not always mandatory. It's often often um, optional. Yeah, I think my question was more as a, as a town bylaw, uh, as it pertains to the, the entire town, not specific uh, developments. And also, um, uh, I was wondering if it can apply to just 
developments that are just um, uh, cul-de-sacs or subdivisions. Subdivisions. <laughs> yes. <Thank you. laughs> Yes, it can. I mean, inclusionary zonings come in many different flavors, as Liz said. If you're interested in a resource about inclusionary zonings, I'm going to direct you to a website of a quasi-public state agency called Mass Housing Partnership. Their website is mhp.net, um, so pretty simple. They have a t uh, something called the Housing Toolbox, and that is a website that has a whole bunch of different kinds of best practices, and under their zoning, they have a variety of goods, and what, what they consider to be good inclusionary zoning examples. But there are many inclusionary bylaws across the Commonwealth. Great. Thank you both very much. <laughs> Abram Baskin, I live at 43 Carvel Avenue, and um, we live in a teardown, but it's a 2,700 square foot teardown. Um, and I remember at the time, uh, my wife happened to know the builder, and he said that Lexington needs more new houses of that size and not the 5,000 square foot teardown. Um, but, uh, but I do have a question as well. My specific question is, um, is it too much of an oversimplification to say that the reason that there's very little new net new housing being built in Lexington or the town where I grew up, which is Norwood, is that at the end of World War II, you had this steep growth because it was lots of available land. And like my wife grew up on Hathaway Road. Those were all new, the original houses were all new houses you know, in the mid late 50s. And, but most of that land is gone now. And so when you talk about, you know, Austin, Texas, I'm speculating that Austin, Texas has a lot of available land for building housing. Okay. And is that too much of a normal simplification? Um, the population increase and the amount of land is true, and also the development of the interstate highway system and automobiles all did lead to that. Um, but I would say in Lexington uh, in particular, one of the things that's happened is that uh, actually the zoning has gone down. That is, the zoning has been, it's called down zoning. And so there are um, places in Lexington that were originally built in the 1920s on 8,000 square foot lots. Um, we no longer have 8,000 square foot zoning. And so the zoning has actually um, been reduced over time. I can't tell you the exact history of exactly how that happened in Lexington. But I would say that there is not opportunities to build on smaller lots um, in, a, in a basic way, you know, in, by right, you know, without going through a special permit process. And I've, I've looked at the special permit provisions in Lexington currently. They're very complicated. Um, there's also no multifamily zoning in Lexington. I think East Lexington allows some duplexes by right, but that's about it. And so in the past, pre-World War II, there was much more intense, um, how, or I shouldn't say much more, there was different housing products, duplexes, triplexes, quads, they were built, um, and we don't see those anymore, and nor do we allow them by the zoning. Tom Scheigel, uh, town meeting member. My uh, question was put to Matt, and I think the question was just answered partially, but so I'll, I'll rephrase it a little bit. The question is going to be, what changes would need to be made to incentivize developers to build duplexes where they're building single-family homes now? And I guess part of the answer is they're not allowed to. Um, have there been proposals made in the recent past which would change zoning to allow duplexes, say, by right, everywhere? Sure. Um, so I would say, given all of the um, fervor over school enrollment and all these other things, Two family by right, either across town or as an overlay district, um, is kind of a non starter. There has, a couple years ago, the planning board did put forth a two family by special permit, um, and that also was not very favorable. Um, you know, it's a, it's a mix of, um, I don't know, folks are fairly resistant to change, so I think a lot of people, um, there's arguments all on all sides about density and the character of the town, the single family nature, but um, there have been efforts to do that. Uh, I will say, you know, even in, within that framework, uh, it's, you, you may not necessarily get the diversity, it's kind of an example like this. Uh, the, the, the closest one I would look, look to, if you go through East Lexington, drive over um, just in front of the little strip mall, kind of over near where, um, you know, uh, Berman's is and Nick's place and that kind of area, there's a very large two family 
that um, required um, almost six months of excavation of the lot to fit that, to build that two family to the, to the full buy right allowable. It was a pre existing two family. And even in that case, you basically have two mansions sharing a wall. Um, so you have to kind of do a lot of these things in concert to really get that. But I think it, you got to look at the economics. Um, you know, builders around here, it's about $180 per square foot, or square foot GFA is what it costs to build housing in Lexington. So when you think about what you're going to spend for the land, how big you're going to build these, those are all the hard costs and you have like the soft costs of you know, architects and financing and all these other things. It, depending on the size of the lot, the margins can't get fairly small, uh, maybe non-existent. So it's kind of one of the reasons you see a lot of activity on, on very large lots because they, they provide more opportunity. It's a, good, it's a good question, um, and I just, I'll add my two cents, is that sometimes, um, so I'm an urban planner, and I've been doing planning for 30 years, I've been, I did it in Oregon, and I've done it in Massachusetts, um, and so I see things a little differently than some people do, and so I'm not, again, prescribing this for Lexington, but just asking you to think about opening up your um, minds. So, uh, for the, who remembers the hotel that was there where Lux Place is now? Did anybody ever stay there? Yeah, I spent one night there. It was not pleasant. <laughs> um, so again, you know, that took a couple town meetings to get that development through. Um, there was a fair amount of gnashing of teeth about it. Um, it is providing down, a downsize opportunity. Um, I do recognize that there are very expensive units. Um, there are some affordable units that are deed restricted, um, which is great. Uh, but I think, um, so the person who developed that, you know, had a vision and said, okay, I think this is a great place and it would be great to have um, residential right near the shops and um, I don't know if there's an elevator in it or not, but if you're, um, there's an elevator. Okay, so, you know, if, um, if I need new hips or new knees um, and I'm older and I'm, again, maybe in that 85 and older category, that's a great kind of development for me. So I guess what I would say is think about um, opening up your mind to where are there other places in Lexington where kind of a mixed-use development like that might um, fit and not disrupt community character, such as the Walgreens parking lot. Um, next to Starbucks, like, whoa, wouldn't that be great? Like, whoa, go down to Starbucks. Um, again, you know, I don't know that the property owner is, but it's just, you know, if you can think about things that aren't there, um, but maybe could be, you know, that's a commercial node, just to use a planner term, um, and that is, there's a bunch of services that are there. Um, so people um, tend to say, well, Lexington's totally built out, but I look at that shop, um, that parking lot, the new retail development that was built in the stop and, you know, the corner of the stop and shop parking lot, I look at the whole stop and shop parking lot, um, the parking lot by the paint store behind the fire station, I look at those and I think, oh, that's neat, that could be a really interesting place, there's a bus run, and there's 62 bus runs right there, um, you know, the, that might be an interesting place. So, I guess what I would say is that while um, change is hard, um, sometimes it's something that's a little bit new. And Lexington Center used to have a lot of mixed-use buildings with residential above that have over time gone away. Um, but that's just something to, to think about is you may not, it's not necessarily all duplexes, but it's maybe just something that isn't there yet. Thank <laughs> you.